welcome this is manak with you i have a uh, viral and anaga from team ascent and we have srini uh, our friend and speaker today um hello srini welcome thank you manak okay thanks thanks manak and thanks friends i think uh, you know uh, i i have seen some of the webinar formats that have been shared with the ascent members previously and uh, you know i also closely work with some of your ascent members uh, working with them as cfo so i uh, you know it's, it's been a pretty good experience and it's 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 working with manak now putting together this presentation for you i think in some sense it is sort of orderly taking it in the to the to the next level where where professor or dr lamba left you uh, in the in the last one where he has talked about romancing the balance sheet um, that's that's a pretty good uh, lecture actually and then he used what exactly liability means and what asset means and then he shared with his mother insights from the rvi survey so i will i will take i and i will quote him a couple of times because you know it, it is in in some sense it is actually a flow through there after and it has got linkages backwards and forward so i will i will link you through that and uh, just to quickly take you through the agenda we will we'll talk about where we are now particularly where where the some of the members are now and uh, sort of reading through you know the crystal glass what are the thoughts on your mind possibly when relevant to the topic and then what is a cfo for smes is that is that you know what topic it is and how relevant it is and how can how can we make it work we will talk about it and then we will quickly do a finance overview what a finance department or a finance team is supposed to do what are the gaps and how do we bridge the gap and we will also quickly go through a couple of case studies and sort of try and understand and these case studies are from our own experience so we will understand that and then to talk a little bit about what we do in cfo bridge and we will take some questions okay now i'll i'll i'll, I'll take you straight to the uh, the where are we now the the good part is that you know the participant all the participants are entrepreneurs about 36% of them are family business so i presume the balance 64% are uh, first generation entrepreneurs and uh, so you definitely there is technical excellence there is some point on which you felt passionate about for which you started this this business and presumably you were you know and, and the, the turnover is more than some 11000 crores so I, I presume that your products are a big hit and services are in demand and i see a variety of business the, the diversity of the business uh, people are running is, is is simply amazing so uh, presumably they are big, big hit and the services are in good demand and uh, and you are making in roads and it is growing because it goes in line with the data that we get for smes in fact i used to work in mncs till about 31st of july and uh, you know i i still have a lot of cfo friends in mncs they dread to talk to me because i ask them what's the kind of talk that is going on what's the kind of growth rates that you guys are discussing they, they don't want to discuss about the growth rates because either they are growing backwards or they are growing at a very very small number but that's not the story with the story of the smes i i i personally i am not aware of any of my clients or smes who are talking of a growth rate less than 40% minimum 40% is the least so you, i presumably you are growing and then you know you, you are acquiring new customers so that's the good part now what's the bad part the bad part is that I, I think market is understanding what you are doing. For every activity that you are doing, there are at least a couple of guys who are competing, catching up with you. 
they are they are, they are trying to they are sometimes they are taking away uh, your stuff and your ideas and uh, margins hello manak can can i can you hear me the same okay so margins, margins are shrinking and at an alarming rate they are going down because of uh, you know essentially because of inflation inflation is chipping it away stop salaries are increasing and the efficiencies that we expected are not happening at the, at the same rate and uh, uh, still you are seeing some good profit but you are wondering where is the cash where has the, all the cash has disappeared because more often than not when i meet entrepreneurs they always ask me this question i said shini i see the profit and loss account and it's another strange state and you know why is that a profit and a loss account is there another profit or loss account we can discuss it separately but there is good profit but there is there is no cash not able to see the cash and then yeah whether or not you pay incentives you know maybe you pay incentive some time or maybe you are delaying it but still you are saying a lot of and staff also have got a good salary increase in line with the market inflation but staff are still not fully motivated to deliver and thought they are they are they are below on, or behind on catching up with the targets and maybe we can you know viral or manak we can run a poll on the first point you know how many of the participants have always wondered how much of you know they make a lot of profit but they were wondering where is all the cash can we run the poll now so uh, shrini yeah uh viral is taking control of this okay in terms of poll yeah just be in touch right. with him on this right okay so uh, yeah fair enough so i i think the poll is already splashed so i I'll, i'll keep going on the talk about the presentation so i i will i will definitely know how many of you are thinking about the cash or the profits so i i talked about the good i talked about the bad i will move on to the the worst part which is the ugly there are there are issues with respect to meeting statutory reduce okay statutory reduce be it service tax or cds or things like provident fund payments they are lagging behind not being paid on time and there are there are consequences and so 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 there are there are there are consequences on account of them and we will cover that in a moment when we talk about exact consequences and then loan repayments are falling behind schedule you are you are you are always worried about the the civil score how do we manage the civil score and there are the fancy words that are being talked about which is something called a cdr which is nothing but a corporate debt restructuring though you don't want to do that but you think you are heading towards that there is no alternative and uh, quite likely that you are not filing your cma statements to the bank on time as a result of which the bank is increasing its interest rate on you there is a penal interest rate if you are not filing cma on time so uh, cma statement is to be filed when you are obtaining working capital from any of the banks so there are penal interest coming on you and uh, then there are debtors and creditors you know the the age of the debtors is is increasing and they are not taking your phone calls and therefore you are not taking the phone calls of your creditors suppliers are trying to reach you through multimodal means saying where is my payment and on top of that our rupee has gone into a free fall markets have become pretty volatile interest rates are you know no people could guess but there are yeah. so so there are there are a whole lot of 
factors which are beyond your control, which are macroeconomic factors, and they are playing, playing to the adverse situation. And the PE market is very tight, nothing is in sight. And uh, because the PE guys are also worried about exits or the series A's, the big boys are not coming through or they are not really willing to lend. So there is, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, dark clouds. So that's that's the the AP part. So we'll we'll move on there just to look at what's on your platter. As far as the finance is concerned, you know, you are getting the standard reports, which are basically profit and loss account. You're probably getting them after about a month's time. But you, you, you just seem to be missing something. I said, you know, is that all enough? I know I'm getting some reports. Or, you know, or, or you're looking into your bank statement or the cash flow statement. You're looking at any one of them and saying that, yeah, I'm getting some data. Is that good enough? Are they incisive enough? Is something which is running in your mind? And your practitioner consultant has given you good advice. But, you know, there is still something which is lacking. You may or may not be able to, you know, solve all the issues. Market team team has given you good advice, but you know the, the, the nobody in the nobody in the system or the staff are not able to visualize the big picture. So why I sort of half down the the good, bad, and the ugly, and then what's on your platter is to sort of give a perfect picture and your own assessment of the system or or the situation rather is that. With so many burning issues, you have technically succeeded, but somewhere financially blundered, you are not really seeing why things are not under control or things are not the way that I expected. It is not necessary that all of the things that I have mentioned are cumulatively correct for everybody who is listening to this seminar. Maybe some portion of this is in some proportion is applicable to all of you in in many different ways. Viral, do we have the result of the poll that we conduct? Hi Viral, do we have the result of the poll that we conducted on cash versus profit? Yes, yes Sweeney. So the result for the poll was 90% said yes, they have faced that and 10% said no. Yeah, so that, that pretty much is in line that, you know, you have the dilemma of profits and the cash reconciliation. And uh, just, you know, relating back to what Dr. Lamba said when, you know, in, in, in his presentation that RBI did a deeper study into why companies have gone into sickness. They studied all the companies that have gone into sickness and they came to a conclusion that things like technical issues or labor issues or any other external issues like what I mentioned foreign exchange or you know any of these issues have contributed to less than 5% of companies running into sickness and 95% of the sickness is due to financial issues. So, and that is, you know, clearly where, uh, is, is where uh, my own thought process as well as I was working into the, the MNCs when I was meeting a lot of, a uh, lot of my friends are in the private equity industry. So as I was talking to them, they were saying that, you know, there is, there is, whenever we go to invest in, in, in a company, because we know that technically the company has got a fantastic idea, they have grown it to a particular level. But before we lend our question, first question is always about, I mean, who is your CFO? Where do we, where do we, you know, what's, what's the uh, reliance that we can place on the governance and how the data is coming through? 
and the answer that they invariably get is that you know there there is no CFO because we can't afford one, and and or we got a CFO who is probably a controller or an accountant, and this is what he produces. So therefore, this this dilemma has always been there, and and also touching base with you know as also Manak said, financial management is not what is the responsibility of the CFO? It's the responsibility of everybody in the company. But essentially, you know, it's it's an age where there is, uh, you know, it's, it's it's getting little bit technical. So in that sense, you know, while you are deeply involved with the business, and you know, since since you are maybe the guys who are taking the decision, you may or may not be able to see yourself vis-a-vis -vis the result of your decision. Because you took the decision, it is quite likely that all your decision will look right. And naturally so, that's 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 pretty normal. So is there some kind of a you know alter ego or some kind of a bouncing board for you to whom you can talk to and to or who can point out to you that look at least in retrospect it looks like this this particular issue has gone wrong or we could have done something different. So that you know you are sort of fully advised on the financial issues particularly, be it, be it technical or non-technical, at least you understand that on the financial issues. So I, I we saw that as a clear gap, definite gap which is existing now. Later on I will also spend some time on why this systemic gap has actually arisen and how we can actually address that. And therefore you you know, I'm moving on to the next slide, which sort of brings in that uh, what what's in your mind. You must be thinking that I wish I had a CFO and an efficient finance team, but I can't afford a full-time one. So, do I look around for a shared CFO team? If I look around for a shared CFO team, and you know, is that a CFO or an EFO? And is that how 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 concrete is that idea, or as a full, know, some kind of a shared shared service working into a very um, very very intimate and and very uh, personal to the company, which are handling a lot of sensitive and confidential data. How do I deal with that on a, on a shared as as a shared service? And what 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 do I do with respect to what they promise versus what they delivery? Because essentially, shared service would like to work with many players, and therefore there will be some promise that they do to you. But how do I know that they provide me the the relevant time that they have promised that they will do? So how do I manage the promise versus delivery? And going by some of the questions that have come through. You know, we, we saw about uh, some some questions which have been given to us from this. The one thing that the team, as well as anybody for that matter, would probably be concerned about is how do I measure the the value addition by the CFO team, and how do I hold them accountable? Because I have a higher leverage with respect to my staff. Do I have the same leverage with respect to a shared service CFO team? Should we work with them? And how do we, you know, if that is the case, how do I measure what do they say? And then is just the CFO good enough for me? You know, would that mean that a CFO will come and share with us? You know, this, this is the classic question of consulting versus execution. You have you have a CFO who comes and who tells us that, you know, this is the right thing, that's the right thing. And then is that the execution responsibility is left back to the team? Or do we hire a full fledged CFO team who is tasked with implementing what he is preaching? Or is that a preacher versus preacher and implementer as a team? Is uh, another another aspect. And then do we ask the CFO only to handle you know the accounts or we ask him to handle the other aspects of finance? Now I'll touch base on what are the other aspects. You know, the holistic is a nice word to use. But the other aspects of finance, you know, finance is generally dealt with. There are, there are about three 
essential pillars of a finance and then there is one thing which sort of a overhang which is which is a sort of overarching thing on all the three pillars the first pillar is about accounting i mean fundamentally there is no finance if there is no accounting the bookkeeping or the scorekeeping the rudimentary bookkeeping is the most important one because that's what is the engine that tells you at least it captures all the data and it produces information so the bookkeeping team is a we no financial stroke non financial so the the first pillar is where the data is getting accumulated and the second pillar is about the analysis and weaving that interweaving that with the strategy trying to see what the the, the strategy implications are there with respect to the financial results which are coming through so it is essentially analytical second pillar and then the third pillar is about the governance and the compliance the governance and the compliance is is with respect to the fundamental things like separation you know internal controls separation of duties and uh, looking at you know maybe rudiments of in internal audit and then the whole lot of statutory compliance the service tax income tax reserve bank of india uh, or and even simply submitting cma tax cma statement timely to the bank so compliance is the third pillar or compliance and governance which is which is you know higher plane is the third pillar and then we have got the second pillar which is the analysis and the first pillar is the accounting so you know do we look at it in a in a in a holistic manner or we just look at only on the accounting approach and then do we look at standardized processes or looking at evolving process that is more suited to us so these are some of the questions that you know you will you will need to think through before engaging even if you are setting up your own finance team you will have to think through all these aspects in any case so uh, if, if you are definitely getting in the shared service cfo you you will have to think through all these things And, and and you have to have some clarity in your own mind and you should ask him whoever is the service provider you should ask him saying uh, buddy tell me how you will do this and how you will uh, you know assure me on on this kind of thing and you might also want to ask him not only that how he assures of some of the past experiments or experiences that he has got maybe he can share it some of the case studies you know on a very confidential basis or without revealing the client's name you can sort of generically share it to you what are his experiences so that's you know sort of a slide on guidance of some of the high level issues that you will need to think through before engaging a a full fledged so okay now i i just will quickly take you through as to why this systemic gap has come and you know why it should be on a shared service basis rather on uh, why not why not it, it can be on a i mean on, on a full fledged or a, or a fully dedicated basis we we know that there are you know msme growth rates is pretty good and uh, it is still very good for macro you know the macro economic factors are absolutely good to the extent that i have seen i have seen absolute optimism whenever i you know visit the clients office and come back my optimism barometer actually goes up so uh, you know i i i get into i when i read economic times i get a little bit melancholic i get into a little bit of pessimism and then i come to my office and go to my talk to my clients i get very very optimistic so msme is one group which is absolutely optimistic so there are favorable economic indicators and the group is growing and then there is a very very deepening startup culture and we already seen that about more than 60% of uh, you know the the ascent member are 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 new startups and we are seeing lots more uh, help that is happening in terms of uh, lot more happening in terms of tai uh, tae the indus entrepreneurs or the government itself and then the 
the private equity players also are helping so they are they are helping you to deepen the startup culture and then there is this increasing pe funding that is happening so what was what was the phenomenon that was happening during the time of the industrial revolution back to 1800s in the uk is a phenomenon that was happening of what is called separation of ownership and management so companies were going in for raising funds from the public and and then a select group of people will run the company so that resulted into what is called separation of ownership and management now apart from the fact that you know private companies cannot list actually i have now you know it's it's a statement to make is that private companies are no longer private they are actually more public than the private and in in some sense there is nothing private about private companies actually you can go and get all the data about the private listed companies from the roc sites they are just masking one statement but that is you know you can you have a lot of proxies to even retrieve that particular statement uh, or or even offline methodologies will help you to retrieve that statement um, and uh, there is uh, you know uh, there there is more separation of ownership and management in between the the in, in the pe's uh, because of the pe funding in the private enterprises so private enterprises are growing public in a slightly different manner and then on top of that you know we we need the the increasing complexities and 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 the needs of all the three above is resulting into a lot of very niche financial competency and all the four factors have actually exacerbated in the last i would say about 5 to 6 years in the indian scenario and they have created a massive need for a very dedicated financial or or dedicated you know i would say somebody else to look at the the cfo function for for various companies i just want to pass here for a moment just want to do a poll on the face of the webinar just want to get a feedback as to viral could you do the face of the webinar poll please for me so that i can sure of the speed with which i am going the flash in the street okay so i get a feeling that it is just right by more than 75% so that's pretty good thank you so this this systemic gap is getting created because you know a cfo i mean i was a cfo of bharti axel life insurance i can hardly find it acceptable to work for any one of my clients on a full time basis and neither the companies can afford me for the cost that i was getting in bharti axel so you know there is a need but the trained and mature manpower is not available so this is sort of increasing the the systemic gap for the msmes and startups and that needs to be addressed and the only way it can be addressed is by way of shared services wherein the entrepreneur gets by working for more than one company he makes his own money and at the same time you know the complexities are also not too much in such a way that it demands a very very fully dedicated uh, cfo there so it, 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 there is there is there is there is a case for a, a, a very uh, flourishing new segment of business which is shared service business shared service cfo business and now i'll i'll sort of 
move on to other module and then I will try and weave what I have said earlier back into, into one. Now, what is it that a finance department or a finance guru that has to do? What is his role? So as I mentioned earlier that these are the three pillars. There are card keeper, cost controller, and, and cost controlling, you know, I, I, I have seen that cost controlling comes pretty naturally to a finance guy. And uh, you, you just give him that amount, of, that much amount of uh, the, you know, the, the headroom. Or, you know, quite sometimes you also might have to give him a target. You say, boss, go and save X rupees on this particular area or Y percentage of some of these costs, controllable costs. And he will quite willingly take that. And in fact, uh, in my own personal experience, whenever we have given a target to the people on cost, uh, 8 out of 10 times they have done the right things to reduce the cost. I mean, 2 out of 10 times sometimes they would have done something out of exuberance. But that's okay because you get, you get value for money because you go back and discuss and negotiate with the same guy, you get much more benefit. So record keeping and cost controlling is one aspect. The second aspect is data analyzing and operationalizing the strategy. We will spend some time on that in, in, in one of the slides below. And then possessing the legal know-how and keeping the statutory problems at bay, which is the third sort of the governance, the overarching governance issue, third one. Those are the three roles that a finance guy has to play. Now, little bit more into costs now as we deal there. Costs are not, you know, most of the time people tend to take a look at that cost as just one line. You know, my operating costs as X percentage of my revenue. But my experience tells me that not every cost is the same. If you further analyze the cost into various segments and buckets, there are costs which are called fixed costs. A good example of fixed cost is salary and rental. And they increase once in a year or once in every 12 months, let's put it that way. And then it's more or, more or less sort of predictable increase. You know, salary increases by about 10 percent, more or less the same every year. And rent increases by about 5 percent. So fixed cost which sort of increases once in 12 months time and variable cost, variable cost remains constant per unit. However, it increases or decreases with respect to your levels of activity in an organization. Uh, yeah, yeah, good and you know more easiest example of a variable cost is uh, material consumption or uh, you know if you are if you are consuming you know electricity for operating running machines then electricity will become a variable cost or if you are consuming any other consumables materials they all will become variable cost or if you are paying variable incentives to your sales staff that also will become a variable cost. And there are a lot of one time costs which are either you know when, when the company is initially setting it up there could be a one time cost of the set of costs and so they will be few. The discretionary cost is you know is, is something which you should watch out and you should also watch out what you are questioning as discretionary cost. For example, travel travel expenses are discretionary cost. In these days of you know fantastic technology, uh, there may not be a need to travel, but travel cannot be completely taken away uh, from the business because nothing like meeting, personally interacting and understanding the the body language and the taking a, a, a vibrations check directly. However, travel is a discretionary cost. So these are the costs which have to be analyzed and not only analyzing these costs, you also have to analyze what does this mean to my operation, has to be clearly understood. So then you have to, these costs, you have to consider them into your pricing. Now let me, you know, let me look at one of the fallacies that I have seen um, entrepreneurs normally do is 
the reason why I call it as a fallacy is this is one issue where I have literally, uh, you know, nothing short of, uh, uh, you know, having to provide work really very hard with the entrepreneur saying that, boss, this is not how it works. This fallacy is, this is my cost, therefore this is my price, is the fallacy. Entrepreneurs, they look at their own cost. This is exactly my cost base and therefore this has to be plus my margin and therefore this has to be my price. Whereas the right strategy or actually the textbook strategy is that this is my price, therefore this is my cost. You got to work backwards. The price gets dictated by what the customer will pay. The price gets dictated by what the market will take. And then you got to work on your margin because margin, you know, as Mr. Lamba said earlier, capital has got a cost. So you got to fix your cost of capital here. If this is how I am bringing in capital, this is my cost of capital, I got to make this much amount of money. And therefore, the cost of capital means, therefore, it works out the X percentage of my turnover. The turnover less my margin gives you the gross cost and then you have to work backwards on the cost. And within that cost pool, how do you accommodate your fixed cost and variable cost? Because variable costs get priority. Without variable cost, there is no sales. Then you have to work on fixed costs. Then you have space for one time or discretionary cost. So if you work backwards and set up a nice uh, planning or budget, it will work wonders. But that's definitely a CFO's role to see what are the items of cost and how it works and how it needs to work is, 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 is something that he can do. And then, you know, in the play of these three musketeers, which are profit and loss account, cash flow and balance sheet, now we will, we will go back to the the question. Ninety percent of you have said that you know I made profit, but I don't know where is my cash. So there are these three accounts, sorry, three statements that gets made in any finance department, which is profit and loss, cash flow, and balance sheet. What does it mean for all these three documents, and how does it impact one another? They are very intricately intertwined because essentially. The p &L and the cash flow, you know, when it all gets together, it forms the balance sheet. Balance sheet is nothing but the result of the p &L and the cash flow. And 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 the how it how it impacts, what are its implications? While I will spend a little bit time on that, I want to do another poll right now, and it depends upon industry to industry as well. I just want to ask Viral to run the poll on asking the participants to rank in the rank of importance to them the profit and loss account, cash flow and the balance sheet. Viral, if you can run the poll. We will we'll know the, the answer in a moment. Okay, the answer is coming through. So the profit and loss is a statement which you know I will I will take a I will define them in in a, in a very highly gross and summary level. Profit and loss is a statement which gives an account of the income and the expenditure, and the cash flow gives an account of the inflows and the outflows, and balance sheet is the result of your profit and loss and cash flow. For example, you know, the reason why uh, I, 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 you know, it's on expected lines. I think 92% uh, of the people have said that they like the cash flow statement or cash flow is the priority. 8% have said profit and loss account and nobody has said balance sheet. And you have all romance the balance sheet. I think, you know, I'll, it, 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 that's pretty interesting to me actually. And as a finance guy, I find that intriguing. And uh, you know, you, you know, you know, if you get a if you get a chance to interact, we might even challenge you. Um, rather, it's there is actually no one answer. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, let let's take a financial service. NBFC or a lending business, for example. In a lending business, 
uh, more important is going to be the balance sheet followed by cash flow statement followed by profit and loss plan. The biggest impact in, in the form, I am not saying anything is less or more important, but in the order of priority, they will look at balance sheet first and then the cash flow and then the profit and loss plan. Now let us look at a business like myself, which is a consulting business. Uh, you know, I will quite happily agree with you that it is it's 0 percent as far as balance sheet is concerned because I have no assets and I have no liabilities. My assets are all intangible. It is only the intellectual assets that I bring into the business. And for me also, profit and loss amount will be more important than actually the cash flow because if what is very important for consulting business is, you know, what are the levers which are running your, uh, uh, you know, how much you are spending, what is your gross margin, what are your expenditure and what are your overheads. And you know my my professor when I learned uh, you know business accounting he he made one statement which is sort of very very important to me even these days I mean it looks like a very simple statement but it's very profound what he told me is the secret of success in a business Rini, is to sell a high margin product and scale keep your overheads under control and you know so three things that he told me. Your product has to be high margin and you got to scale and you have to keep your overheads under control. If you do these three things, you are doing well. With respect to profit and loss account and, and, and you know the cash flow, then balance sheet is, is a completely different game. So that is the importance of the profit and loss account. If the, you know, in, in, a, in a consulting business, profit and loss account becomes more important, followed by cash flow and zilch on balance sheet. I wouldn't even worry about balance sheet. Now, you know, some of the businesses like, like a trading business, in a trading business, cash flow statement becomes very important, followed by profit and loss account, followed by balance sheet. So every business is very different. What will become very important to you is some questions to sort of ground rules to help you to uh, decide. For example, if you are more concerned with the source and the application of funds, that is where you source your funds if it is going to have a highest impact on your business. In the case of an NBFC, what highest impact is where they are getting incremental funds for them to lend. Is it going to be equity or is it going to be borrowing? So if you are more concerned about your source of business, balance sheet will become very important for you because that controls your business and that controls your, your, your earning. If you are a high level of servicing business with less of uh, uh, you know uh, material and equipment investment that is involved then PNL becomes very important and uh, yeah and, and and then cash flow becomes important for most of the other 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 uh, uh, companies and so it is you know somebody has to understand how these things work and you know the, the, the source and the application, how it has to be managed with respect to the balance sheet. So you might, if, if you have not read or gone through uh, uh, Mr. Lamba's presentation, I, I request that you should go through that. And then periodic management reports and dashboard, and that's, that's really important. And then just, you know, very important is this other overhang, what I told you, other than the three pillars, how do we operationalize the strategy? We received a lot of questions saying that, you know, what a CFO will do for a digital advertising business, what he will do for a printing business, what he could do for a manufacturing other businesses. While you would have seen that there are, you know, specialists, finance guys can easily you know, move from one industry to another industry because what will normally happen is in any business, you can distill them to what is called the least common denominators. Every business is trying to do two, three things, right? Every business is trying to do, bring in materials and services, process them, add value 
and then sell them. So that is essentially what I call as LCDs, least common denominators. And people can actually focus on the least common denominators. There are quite likely that there are a lot of things are possibly not going right in this area. And that itself could constitute something like about 70% of the work to be done. So even, a, even if the CFO is, you know, <coughs> just looking at it, and he can, in a, an effective CFO can look at your 70% of the issues and he can fix it in no time. Because if he, if he is able to distill to the least common denominators, and that's where the biggest issue goes wrong. In fact, I have seen, for example, I worked for 20 years in life insurance industry. And I can share with you, the life insurance industry, no company has gone bust because of pricing. Or even general insurance company has not gone because of pricing of risk or pricing of mortality. They all have gone bust because they did not service the customer well or they did not service the, you know, they did not take care of the investments properly. So, the highest risk for any business actually lies in the LCDs and therefore that needs to be attended to. And therefore, you know, some kind of a specialization can always be built upon over a period of time. I'm not saying belittling specialization. Specialization is important, but it can always be built upon. And the strategic linkages between economic and non-economic factors has to be analyzed. And you got to analyze leakages. Where exactly, you know, things are not happening exactly the way you liked it. Why are leakages happening? And then you list down achievable milestones. Then you go behind funding, what is good for me, what kind of source, and when should I do. And, 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 and maybe, you know, we can, we can run the, probably the last poll, which is talking about uh, private equity, viral. we can run the poll on how many of the participants are looking to raise funds through private equity means in the near future. As we go through that, I'll I'll quickly gloss through this slide. You can even find this slide in our in our We have a 30% yes looking to raise PE money, 50% no, and 20% depends. So, I mean the depends is a very broad sector. At least 30% of them are looking to raise money through PE money. And so they need to chart out all the, you know, they got to get the books clean, they got to have operationalized the strategy, and they need to get it ready to, you know, if they are looking for PE money, which is actually parting with the expensive equity. They need to do this job thoroughly so that you get good value from the investors. So, you know, so the, 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 the goals are summarizing growing fast, inadequate finance support. The goal is adequate finance support function. Need for finance expertise, but can't afford a full. Yes, I have seen excessive focus focus on financial lag indicators. There are definitely financial and non-financial indicators and there are lag and lead indicators. So how do we balance every business is very unique. How do we balance between financial, non-financial lead and lag indicators so that the MIS is more complete and it tells you rather than telling you what happened in the past, can it be a little bit predictive what is going to happen and any MIS say that. And it is quite possible to say that because if you start focusing on lag and lead indicators and 
yeah, we talked about funding and then and then the last one is also recruiting and developing good finance team. That's really critical because most more often than not people have difficulty with respect to uh, recruiting uh, the right finance team. So at the time of recruiting itself, you need some, some kind of a help so that if the, you know, the team that comes in is something that stays with you and that gives you all the value. So this is the current status on the left side. On the right side is all the goals that we want to achieve. And then, you know, we got to bridge the gap and make the complex finance into something which is very simple that can work on. So that's the goal of a shared CFO. Now, having said that, you know, is there all, uh, is there all a bit of a gas that I talked about and is there any more uh, delivery? Uh, just to share with you, we'll, 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 we'll go through some of the uh, probably three uh, case situation, right? And what is the, one of the companies is, is a decade old veteran in its field. They, they know that, how long they have been in the business. They know the business inside out. And they want to grow fivefold in five years time. Is that something, you know, is that possible? Well, that's, that's the goal that is stated, the board has stated that we want to go there. And uh, how to achieve this and how to be more profitable. Okay, we can grow business, how do we be more profitable? So they engaged us and then what we did was we analyzed their entire operation. They were earlier having only one sort of, uh, so to say, an SBU or a profit center. Because that, that's the company. I mean, there is nothing else. It's, it's not there. You know, the whole company was one, one profit center. Then we split them into three segments. And then we did a segment-wise cost analysis to identify each activity's profitability individually. This is something that they have never seen. And they said that, no, it's not possible because the first process feeds into the second process, the second process feeds into the third process. So it's all one and same. We actually proved it to them that it is not the case. You know, you have a possibility to say no to some of the processes if that is making losses for you. So we proved it to them that it is possible. Or you can look at some other way of looking at it or price it differently. That's also a possibility. And we said that, you know, how do we reduce the direct cost? Once we started analyzing the cost into fixed variable discretionary, then they, then they understood the importance of the variable cost into the sales. And they actually saw a situation wherein costs were not, the variable costs were not actually variable. They were sitting there more like a fixed cost. So they wanted to work on the cost later on. And then we did the pricing study. We told them that which are the segments where, you know, the pricing should be improved. We recommended that areas where they have to go and renegotiate the price and they need to look at uh, then we also prepared a five-year financial plan. This happened about three months ago. So what is the result? An immediate reduction in the contract labor cost by about 20% because the variable cost was truly set to variability. And then they got an automated MIS, which is talking about those three segments. And the, the lead times, the MIS lead times were reduced by more than 15%. And then they started working on the pricing for all the clients. So that's one of the case studies. What the you know the, the idea here is segment-wise analysis of the operations, segment-wise analysis of the cost, and establishing the correlation. The point that I was sort of over emphasizing uh, a bit earlier is, is pretty critical to achieve this. Moving on to the second case study, another established service provider. How to improve profitability and then how do I do standardized process for existing operation? Very simple uh, engagement principles for us. And then we looked at, once again here we applied same cost segregation, fixed variable and discretionary. This company is more, it, it requires to focus more on the balance sheet. Then we help them to identify source of funding. And you know, data sort of excites me. When I look at a range of data, the age old principles of just analyzing the mean mode standard deviation is a fantastic technique that everybody has to use. You first look into the data range 
eliminate the outliers, the left hand side and the right hand side, then you got the balanced data. Just apply the age old principles of what is the mean mode average and then you look into the, yeah. the standard deviation. Then they were actually stunned to see the standard deviation of the sources of funding is pretty significant, which means that you know somebody is lending at a very high rate, somebody is lending at a very low rate, so they got to work on it. And then they worked on it, then they had a target standard deviation going forward. They said we are not going to borrow at the any rate more than this. And that helped them significantly to shore up the profitability. And what happened to the impact? Company has doubled the profitability in the last one year and financials are now coming out on the first business day of the next one. And uh, then there is a startup. Conundrum, how do I scale after one year? And then, you know, all lot of things I am doing wrong, I am not paying service tax on time, I am not even registered for service tax, I am wondering whether I am doing service. And then there are legal matters, so there are lots of issues. So our solutions, we prepared a business plan preparation from scratch, we shared an information memorandum for private placement, we helped them on avenues of funding, we circulated the private placement data to all our network ourselves. We handled and set right the taxation, we registered them for service tax, getting the right sized accounting team, we recruited the accounting team and then we gave it to them and then drafted an active term sheet for them and then consultant, we are consultant beckoning at all times, we are just one stop shop. Impact on performance, company is in advanced stages of negotiation, they are very close to tying up with the PE funder. And I think, you know, they, they normally there is a there is a word going on. I mean, those 30 percent of you who are looking to raise PE funding, don't be disheartened if somebody tells you that the market is poor. I think if the idea is great and if the, you know, if, if the passion is there on the person who is putting it forward, there is always money. If, I'm, I presume you are reading Friday Economic Times, the last but third page, which contains the success stories of uh, startups. Um, money is being raised every week. So I don't think there is any problem with respect to money coming through for the right needs. So so we they will very close closely to they will do it. And then the most important thing is the guy who was lending, he appreciated the details that were provided in the business plan. And needless to say, he he took our contacts and then he's he's one of our biggest evangelists right now. And then I will just talk a little bit about CFO Bridge, what we do, though I talked more about finance and finance team and the shared service, uh, shared service CFO team. Our model is based on BOTT model, which is build, operate, train and transition model. So we, we don't, you know, our idea is not to, you know, cling on to the client for a long time. We believe that we are a school and if a school is trying to retain the student to the same standard, Nobody will go to the school. So our idea is that you come, come and join us. In, if you are in LKG, our idea is that we will put you onto UKG. If you are in first standard, we will put you onto second standard. So our, the idea is to uh, 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 do a build, operate, train, and transition. And that's how we have been doing uh, in, in with all our clients. And then one-stop solution shop. We have not only the requisite technical expertise. We also have with us shortlisted and empaneled Muted. the department secretary or a taxation guy because if I have to build all these competencies within my firm, my overheads will be pretty high and I will have to ask you for a higher charge of trade. So I understand what is meant by variable cost very well, therefore I kept my cost variable to a large extent. I, I have limited my fixed cost, I kept most of my cost to variable so that I can give you the benefit of billing. And uh, so once one stop solution wherein you won't need to talk to all those practitioners, they all will work at the back end and I will be the one stop shop. You come to me and then I will help you to get all the, uh, 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 all the, all, all the uh, yeah. Then our focus has been on focus on financial lead and lag indicators, non-financial and uh, you know sometimes we are uh, Excessively, we will recommend focusing on non-financial lead indicators because that's what is going to tell you what is coming at you. 
and data analysis data excites me as well as my team you know you give any data we will find some meaning around the data i mean you know we say that if there are 100 dots to connect for you to find a lion you know i'm sure you have played this game when you were young most likely we will sight the lion when we are connecting the 10th or 12th dot than waiting for 25th dot so we are pretty good in that analysis and uh, advice on the private equity funding legal matters is is a one stop shop we, we you know we have very very vast network of private equity guys who are uh, who have told us to share with them all kind of uh, you know ideas that we get so we work very closely with them and many of them have been my friends and colleagues from my corporate days statutory compliance i i believe this one we have to get it right i think you know if the, the light is amber it is better to stop if the red is red sorry if the if the light is red you stop you don't even think about it who is coming behind you so that's the advice on statutory compliance you know so we don't take fungas or we don't take any uh, any any chance at all on statutory compliance it has to be impeccable and then ours is delivery focused because on a lighter vein i just want to share with you i mean i worked both as an employee and as a consultant i am fully aware that as an employee you have a broader range of performance assessment you assess them on a scale of 1 to 5 but i understand that as a consultant my assessment is binary good or no good so you understand that i have to be delivery focused otherwise you may not renew my contract so that that that's pretty important and then you know and then we have built a very diverse team as we were expanding with the client base we started with one now we got about uh, 10 plus and growing by the day and we have demonstrated our ability to hire teams so that we can service the expanding client base and therefore which we will continue to do so therefore there will be no worry about bandwidth and there are you know there are there are, there are people who are in fact a lot of employees are also pretty excited to work with this kind of a model because there is no where they are going to get an opportunity to work for a diverse set of industries and and to be a you know to understand these kind of complex issues it's not going to get them if you work for any one company you work for one company here you work for several companies so it's equally exciting to the employees as well it's equally exciting to us i think therefore what we offered in the last one and a half years we quite liked what we are doing we we, we are enjoying what we are doing and our clients are uh, talking good about us they got some pretty good uh feedback so that's where we are see for bridge and rest of the data is available in our website you can go through we can actually handle some q and a right now uh, viral and manak if you have got questions uh, you can handle them yeah. thanks trini i think that was extremely crisp and very well covered um you know the questions will perhaps get typed along the way we've already put in a message uh but i believe we, have we some, already have some questions sample questions so should i go through them yes i think you should yeah okay uh one question that i get asked uh, every time is about how would you you know your shared service operation how would you manage and maintain the the uh, privacy and secrecy of our uh of 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 our operations and we we do two three things one is we have a very strict nda with our clients and our nda is designed to survive our arrangement which is our nda is permanent it it has a life of its own irrespective of our arrangement with you that's something which is onerous but very clearly we have taken it up on us and second thing is we don't sign up anybody else in direct competition with you in the same line we just go with one client in that area and you know so and and we believe that when it comes to integrity as my dad used to say when it comes to integrity strini there is no it's like jumping a well there is no 99% jumping the well you either jump the well or you don't jump the well so integrity is the cornerstone so we believe that i think combined with the documentary stuff on nda and then our practice of avoiding competition combined with integrity we managed to ensure privacy so far questions that are being typed for you so once you finish covering these we'll get on to those so uh, 
then there are questions relating to what is the shared CFO service, is it sufficient, how will we allot correct and requisite time to you. So we have, you know, a shared CFO service is, you know, it's, it's, it's like using your lawyer or a doctor on a shared basis, you know, it's, it's as simple as that. And uh, what we do is we just sit with the, uh, with the, with the, with the owner or the CEO and then sort out what we are going to do in the next first one or two months we take time to understand we do a we do a 15 day thorough study and then it will take us time at least two months time to put together what we think is the short term deliverables and the medium term deliverables because we keep our vision only over six months time because anything to look at beyond six months time is is a bit difficult to predict so we keep a six months time 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 table and then we tell you that these are possibly what you can expect from us and uh, and we try to stick to the timelines and then you know more or less we have delivered around the timelines and finance is one area where you know it's it's it's, it's pretty difficult there are a lot of interlinkages so we try to stick to the timelines and so far i don't think we have gone we very much off we provided pretty much and uh, I think with respect to time, you know, time is something that we look at a six months time and then we try and see how much time will be required and then we try and uh, equalize it over six months time and then say that yeah, this is what is going to be our time that we need for you. And that has been largely right. You know, there are times when we might have on our own, we would have worked more on, on your venture because, if, you know, the time that we try to understand your venture, time try to uh, put things like this and you know so uh, if you don't you know this, there may be times when we have actually worked more so I'm not aware of any situation where we have worked less on on, on this and then um, well if you you know third question is if you need a full time CFO I would say you go ahead with the full time CFO and I can help you with one absolutely at no cost we can you know we have I have a very well tied up into the CFO network I can get the full time CFO. That's not a problem. And then, how will the CFO team, bridge team, will integrate with your Srini, finance team? Yeah, yeah, Mana. Srini, this is Mangalak. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to have a quick, uh, you know, on behalf of the members, uh, point two and three. Yeah. You know, wanted to pick your thoughts. Typically, you know, for most entrepreneurs who are transitioning from an enterprise to an organization yeah. right uh, in the in the process of growth mm -hmm. one of the key things really is uh, you know and if you see it from an entrepreneur's point of view one of the challenges is the learning curve mm -hmm. of uh, getting structures in the enterprise or in the organization right mm -hmm. now when you go through a CFO engagement and the kind of engagement that you have outlined, yeah. there is a certain learning curve because most entrepreneurs have not perhaps been through this. Uh, and th th the answer when you ask about profit and loss, uh, balance sheet and cash flows is it all, 90% are more operationally driven. And yeah. hence the yeah. focus is a lot more on cash flow. So do you, I think there is relevance in question two and question three to say that, okay, once we go through an engagement with, uh, you know, with a, a shared CFO service, uh -huh. you may perhaps come to a point where you say, okay, there is now a better realization and a better appreciation of a organized structure on finance or approach on finance. Yeah. Is that transition managed by you? I think uh, where they go from you know, zero appreciation of the of the function to a better appreciation and perhaps depend in line with their growth, either need that function in house or need a longer hand holding or a longer engagement. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a very, very relevant question. I mean we, we go through that in our actual life. Because as as the you know in the in the early days we are sort of better positioned to impress upon the CEO because we talk with the with, with, with a particular authority on, on the issue. So, so we are able to do that. But as the internal team which is just coming in there and as the internal team is, is, is also falling in place and you know so, so 
we got to handhold them. That's why I earlier mentioned that our model is on BOTT model, which is build, operate, train, and transition. Right. Model. Right. Where you, we, we need to help the transition uh, uh, to them, and uh, otherwise, I have seen that it, it sort of. It's, 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 I wouldn't like to see something that you know we put together sort of fail, and uh, that will be the biggest uh, you know disappointment for us. So we we ensure that the you know if if at all we are putting together a finance team, a full you know in-house finance team, we ensure that the finance team is having its own voice. It's able to raise its voice. It's able to raise relevant questions, and uh, so the the training is more about giving them that kind of a headroom and then sorting out or, or, or smoothening out the rough edges between uh, the finance team and maybe any other team or sometimes even with the, 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 the CEO and, and ensuring that you know the, the culturally they are they can now work together as one team and that's that's really really important and I think that's something that um, as 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 someone who have you know I I've always prided in wherever I left the companies when I was working for corporates, they always left behind a team. So you know it's it's something that is is extremely important for me that the team that we select is is adequate. You know that we we follow a three process uh, sorry three pronged system even for putting in place a finance team, Monica. What we do is people, process, right. and systems, and that's the three-pronged uh, approach. People are at the core of it, and process is pretty important. You know, financial process, how they have to do it, and then the systems, which is the IT system. What what I necessarily mean, IT system or even the MIS system, reporting system. So there has to be an equilibrium between the people, the process, and the system, and we see that the equilibrium is brought in and it is maintained. And I think once the equilibrium is maintained, as the people starting measuring up, that's when we start the transition. And in about six months to one year's time, we, you know, we, we could we could get out, and then the, the local team can. Yeah. Manage. So you know, to my mind, frankly, this was a lot more comprehensive answer to question number three, because uh, to my mind, uh, in an enterprise which is transitioning to in, into an organization, and that yeah. too you know, growing, growing organization, more than putting somebody in the, more than putting somebody in a, in a particular function, especially a CXO function, it is a lot more important for the enterprise, more importantly the entrepreneur, to appreciate what that function is all about. And I think this process of transition that you, that you outlined is critical. Because yeah, more often than not what we've seen, the reason why CEOs you know, outside CEOs and entrepreneurs, the marriage doesn't is always rocky to start with, because of expectation mismatch on both sides, and same goes for various other functions. Correct. And I think this transition per se, and I'm sharing this with the, the, the with the with our friends uh, on the webinar as well, uh, is it important to appreciate this transition? So thanks for that answer. Thank you. And then, you know, sure, we could carry on. One, yeah, I, I'm just addressing the probably the last question that we have got from the thing is how do you integrate with the with the with the finance team that is there in the client's office? And this is sometimes it turns into a challenge because the even the you know the existing finance team thinks that wow there is a competitor who has arrived, or maybe that my job is under threat. What are these guys going to do? And, you know, they are going to come and tell me that all that I did is wrong. They are going to tell something new. So, it, the, so this this sense of uh, and, and and insecurity is pretty high, and we are very very conscious of that in the early stages. So it has to be handled with a kid glove. But of course, where you have to stay firm, you stay firm. And uh, so the you know first is to win their respect, saying that wow, these guys know something that yeah. I think therefore the way we position is that. Here is your best opportunity for you to learn. That's why the third T is very important, which is the train. So where is wherein you will get somebody who will stand by you next to you, you know, on a retainer, who will train you all the time. Here is an opportunity to learn, and then move on. So once the learning of aspect is you, you, you know emphasized, and they are able to see that yeah, okay, we are going to learn, and then eventually we are on our own. 
then they start completely opening up and then they sharing with you starting to collaborate with you and understand that so you know we, we never we, we, we understand that we can never be disruptors we got to be collaborators and we got to be uh, teaching and there is you know we, knowledge grows by sharing so we definitely ensure that the staff of the uh, I want I missed Srini sorry I just wanted to uh, did you say that you cannot be disruptors that I understand but did you also say you cannot be collaborators either no, or no, you no, can no, be collaborators yeah, we have to be collaborators. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, we got to be collaborators. <laughs> okay. because, yeah, and, and, and as, as I earlier mentioned that the three point, uh, you know, the, the important thing in the finance department is people, if you are not able to connect with the existing team, existing people, then you realize that this whole thing will, just won't work. So, it, it is up to us, we got to try everything to ensure that we connect with the team, existing team. You'll have to speak up a bit, Srinath. We are losing some of your words. Uh, oh. See, you could just speak a bit loudly. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's no, uh, uh, okay. I'm just holding the mic close to me. Um, yeah. So, we, we understand that our success is depending upon the ability with which we are able to be part of the team. And how quickly we just naturalize the process is when we can start producing the results for the company and so that's that's right. critical for us and we we over emphasize here saying that look you can learn from us and we, you know we will train you in all this and the learning always means you know learning is progress so we over, over we link the learning to the progress and the fact that we also share the stories of what we have done elsewhere so they get comfortable with that yeah lovely Okay. Super. So I think uh, this has been very interesting, uh, especially the way you captured every aspect of the topic to a large extent. Uh, I know that the format, uh, there's a lot more to drill into as we move along. Now we've got yeah. some questions coming in, Srini, and I'm going to curate some of these questions uh, in terms no of problem. relevance. Yeah. Uh, there are some which are fairly direct questions. Uh, uh, the one okay. which I'm going to ask right now is very direct. So Anurag Gupta, who's uh, yeah. asked this question, um, his question is, what is the usual cost that I can expect to pay for a shared CFO service? Okay. So, you, Manak, you expect a direct answer from us? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you <laughs> wish to. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, no, no problem. Yours, I think, or you yeah, could no, go, thanks. Or you could go Manak, to Miami way. <laughs> yeah. Many, many of the... Um, you know, I think we have we, we work with a few of the ascent members, so it's, right. it's uh, you know I, so I can't tell you something which is not the case, and uh, and and you know it's it's normally roughly about you know one tenth of the cost of hiring a full time CFO of mine generally it turns out to be, and uh, you know you can. It's, 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 it should be on a case-to-case -case basis in, in the sense that the complexities will determine how much of focus is needed. Do you need a, uh, you know, uh, one day, two day focus, three day focus in, in, a, in, a, in a month? Uh, I'll give some guidelines. In general, I have seen more, uh, more, more users using a, uh, something like anywhere between two two to four or five days focus uh, uh, from us that's what they, they need whereas the two is more actually and uh, the five is less in terms of the complexity of the business also will will determine this maybe there is more time required in the beginning and once things get into uh, some kind of an order there is less time required so we got to consider all these aspects and uh, you know we will we'll, we'll give a pricing and you know so we, 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 we one thing that you know we 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 we're gonna increase or revise our pricing for ever since we started, so it's been uh, in that in that range uh, so far, and we find that to be okay from our side as well. Right. So you know, uh, I'm just trying to understand. And Anurag, while I'm reiterating what uh, you know, Sini just said, in case you are satisfied, put your hand up. Otherwise, just uh, type in any further questions. So. I think what you're saying is it's going to be one tenth that of a, what a 
dedicated CFO would charge. Uh, it is on time and effort uh, basis to a large extent. You tend to be sensitive to the stage and scale of the business uh, and also the effort that is going in. <clears throat> Perhaps it's also linked to the timing of engagement, you know, like you said that initially it is a lot more and then you as move along you get into a uh, more cruise, uh, cruise mode. Yeah. Cruise mode, right. So, uh, of course, Anurag, you can connect with uh, Srini separately for the direct answer you are looking for. <laughs> That's the number. <laughs> but I think what we need to appreciate from Srini is that it is relative. And I think that's a fair point. Uh, what we really need to appreciate is that uh, I don't think we can put a menu approach to this. So thanks for asking the question. And Anurag, if you're OK with that, you go ahead. Uh, I'm just looking for Anurag's name. Anurag, are you okay? Then would you want to put your hand up? We'll carry on to the next one. Uh, Vikram Lele, uh, is on the webinar and his question is, what is the role of a CFO during initial investment phase of a startup? Uh, he's qualified by saying that they are a self-funded startup and they're expecting their product to hit the market in 12 to 18 months. At this point in time, A, do they need a CFO? And if yes, how can they, how can a CFO help? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I found sort of one answer to this is that you, you, you need a CFO, definitely. If, if you've got an organization, you need a CFO. And uh, how much you need? And uh, you know the, the extent and the complexity can you know will will be directly proportional. In his case, it will be uh, very less interaction, and it it might even be you know maybe uh, a phone call and uh, and and, and uh, you know later on. We even have a couple of engagements where you know we 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 have a firmer understanding that we will begin a retainership in six months time to start with. However, currently, you know, we will we'll give them some advice and if it is required. And and there are there are clients like that. I realize that as a startup, you know, if it is self funded, they may or may not be in a position to pay now. If they are looking to have a deferred payment later, that's fine. And if they are looking to have a lesser engagement now with an idea that later on they will engage us, even that's also fine. I think that's that's the way it works. In fact it's it's uh, yeah. So there are models you know, like that. Also, absolutely. And also I think Vikram from my perspective, you know, uh, I engage with a lot of early stage companies and I think at this stage where you are, what you really need, now whether you get that in the context of a CFO, you get that, con what you really need is a validation of your financial model. You also need a hand holding of getting your financial modeling right, just like you would need it for the various other functions. So to my mind, uh, it ought to be seen in that context uh, versus uh, just a function or a position. Uh, and uh, more so by in, in terms of being able to be a guiding force, you know, as you go around. So, you know, Srini, do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So Vikram, um, that's the answer to your question. Um, next is Mahindra, and I think Mahindra, uh, your question uh, was linked to Anurag's question. In many ways, uh, Srini has shared, which was really about the cost for hiring CFO services. So uh, let's move on to Sarika, Sarika Sethi. Uh, her question is uh, simple. She's, she's saying that she's if they have a CFO team already, do you engage for a specific task? For example, uh, identifying the lag in the lead indicators, I found that interesting. Uh, would you be able to do that if they already have a CFO team in place? Yeah, absolutely. We have, you know, uh, in our website we said that we also want to have some product. So we said that we've got three products. The One is the flagship product, which is the retainer model. And the second one is the quarterly diagnostics. And third one is, um, you know, is, is, is very assignment based. So 
So any assignment that uh, you know that sort of clearly defines the input and the output can also be undertaken. Absolutely fine. We no. have done a couple of uh, assignments like that. Great. Sarika's phrase I have so she's satisfied. Thanks, Sarika. Now, uh, Samkit, I think your question in some way has been answered through the presentation as well as what uh, uh, Srini just answered. Are you okay with that or you've got something more and if you do then please type in, okay, he's fine, so that's fine. We next next go on to um, you know Vinit Lohia. I'm just trying to process this question. So he qualifies, and you know what I'm doing is a slightly longish question. So I'm going to assign it to you, Srini. Have a look at it in your control panel, so you can read it. Uh, but for the benefit of the audience. Vinny's question is, we are a processing unit on the outskirts of Mumbai, that's Kapoli. They add only about 25% value addition from their raw material. The business requires very tight control on overhead, such as salaries. In this case, what do you think CFO's profile should be? How can I get one at Kapoli? Well, it would be interesting to see CFO's, especially for Kapoli. So, Srini? <laughs> yeah. Grasping his question, we add only twenty. We add only twenty percent value addition from our raw material. Very tight control. Yeah, absolutely. I, I get a feeling this is a lot more operational. Yeah, uh, it is. It's, it's more manufacturing, and I think yeah, you know, uh, the process has to be laid down, and then there has to be. Uh, you know, it has to be tightly laid down how, how materials or value moves in, into the factory and they have to have a finance overlay on those processes and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, when it, if you just don't control the salary, you control the output rather than the salary. Um, salary may be fine if the guy does enough work, it may be justified. So how do you establish input-output ratios for a given level of salary and how do you define your, your work, for example, what should be the constitution of the gang? Should it be, or the team rather, should, how many people should be there, you know, the, the feet on the floor, how many should be uh, supervisors. So all these things have to be very tightly uh, drawn down and then the CFO can sort of measure uh, this as, as things are happening with the lead and lag indicators and uh, I mean, he, he, he may, if he has got another office, I would prefer to sit the CFO at the other office rather than at Kopoli. But if 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 he is if he is keen looking for somebody at Kopoli, and uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, plain answer is getting a CFO to sit in Kopoli is difficult. Um, but we can, you know, to, we can, yeah. If, if you need a if you need a shared service CFO, that's a different uh, issue altogether. Yeah, sure. I think, yeah. Yeah. So, I think that's that's been answered. Uh, Vineet, if you are, uh, you're okay with that, please share, raise your hand while we move to the next one. Or type it. Uh, here is a perspective more than a question from Manisha, and I think that's a fairly relevant perspective. Mm -hmm. And Srini, your experience perhaps, you know, would be interesting here. You know, a question is, one of the largest issues is the CEO or the entrepreneur uh, allocating time to get the CFO aligned towards company history and requirements. Mm. Now I'll just elaborate on this. I think it is a double-edged uh, sword. One is the CEO, especially the entrepreneur, like uh, with any uh, new personal induction, uh, most entrepreneurs like to hit the ground running and uh, there isn't enough emphasis and uh, effort put on induction, orientation, you know. And on the other hand, uh, your perspectives on how the right CFO, in this case CFO Bridge, proactively would like to get into the past and the history and hence the job description, the roles, etc. So, what's your feel, especially when you're working with entrepreneurs? In, in some sense, 
you know a ceo is a ceo and be it the entrepreneur or whether it is you know some kind of a professional um it is very important for the cfo to to see the way the uh, the ceo is seen and uh, you know it, it is the chemistry which is extremely important um that to to get that to get the see you know i i used to say when i was a cfo myself that there were there are there are many switches that a, a, a finance professional has to go through the first switch is you know from learning to becoming a chartered accountant which is you know, i am a chartered accountant so um which is you know the teaching to learning second switch is from being a controller to a cfo and third switch is from being a cfo to a trusted partner of the ceo and the third switch is the most difficult and complex and um, it's it's you know uh, i mean presumably i got into that after after a lot of learning and i i try to give that learning to some of the cfos now saying that you know why do you want to go through all the pains here is me i got all the learnings take it from me and they are not doing it then i am also realizing that a learning is you know you, you can't really give a few things it's not a plug and play it has to, it's very internal the guy has to see it and uh, so it's the toughest part we can make it we can make it faster if we are all working together but it's a process i think it's 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 got uh, no silver bullet i have seen several cfos failing in the third uh, switch i would have failed at some point of time uh, and i have learned from my failures and it is it is very important switch very complex and it is very uh, um painful is not the right word but it is it's it's, it's very uh, it's very tough switch to get to cumbersome it's very cumbersome yeah you know i'm going to uh, there are a couple of more questions we are about 20 minutes from the uh, closure time uh let me let me lighten this up a bit and i'm going to put uh, srini on the spot friends okay uh, i'm going to ask srini a question as a entrepreneur now he is now on the wild side he's come on our side of the fence now in many ways he himself is an entrepreneur before you go get on to the next few questions srini how's it been for you uh building cfo bridge as an enterprise and as an entrepreneur it's been it's been pretty good uh i got to say i have the same you know optimism as i mentioned to you about all my clients because business has been growing and uh, one of the assign members signed me up on the day that is next day after i uh, got relieved from my previous employment so in that sense i never had a gap straight away started and we have been signing up at the rate of uh, minimum at least one client a month and we will also go you know we will not sign up too many clients because we got to operationalize them and it requires more effort in the beginning so we have been signing up something like one or two clients a month and and we did some assignments on the way and then we grew from you know starting to work from home to hiring one office and then some staff um it's it's been pretty good i think so i i you know if i have to stand up and say i will i will i will say that very happily no problems they pretty good because i see this as you know it's a systemic gap and it's 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 not a it's it, it is a large gap i mean some millions of smes around which are growing and which needs this kind of support so i think the scope is pretty enormous and i am very excited to be here lovely good so you are you are enjoying the entrepreneurial journey let's get back to the questions uh, uh so i have assigned you a couple of questions uh, i don't know if you've been able to read through them uh yeah one 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 that is raised by vinit again is that what you think correct correct that is okay. uh, i'll just read it for the audience once you appoint a good cfo how much time we should give for results another problem we face is running out of patience because of the cost that we indulge in this process is slow so how do you think a promoter should handle this i think there's a good question yes yeah, it's a very good question and you know i i i earlier i mentioned a view that finance is not an area where you can look at uh, quick results uh, but however i think the guy whoever is coming in should 
look at the 70 percent what I mentioned there which is called the LCD least common denominators and invariably what happens is CFOs try to understand the business and they spend a lot of time on understanding the business and trying to understand and maybe the CEO wants him to understand the business first and uh, so before he understands the you know what I say the nuances of the business what I mean is and so he has to understand the business quickly no doubt but once he understood that he should start focusing on the LCDs and then he can start focusing on the nuances so even to deliver results on the LCDs which is least common denominators uh, there are no rules but I think intuitively you would like to you would have to give a CFO anywhere between four and six months time and uh, but you know maybe the first month is more learning honeymoon and then second third month onwards you can sort of give him some very soft targets soft targets means targets on which you know he can he can take more time to do that but from the fourth and fifth month onwards he can start getting the hard targets and six months onwards and that's it all privileges will run he is on his own and he got to deliver so yeah you know i just want to add to that uh, srini and also with the with the friends you know is I think in many ways <coughs> uh, this this whole engagement has to be one of co-creation. You know, uh, to my mind, somebody at such a senior position, a CFO, is you know uh, a fairly strategic uh, you know mindset and a very uh, strategic position. So when you're looking at your, con so it has to be seen in a way where milestones, targets are proactively and collaboratively engaged and built up and defined, which is what Srini had mentioned earlier. And I think that's very important. Uh, hence, uh, one, has to, one has to choose right, <coughs> much like you would choose for any other function. I think that's very important. So it has to be collaborative. Uh, there is another one that's come up uh, from Ashit Lathya. Uh, I don't see that in my experience. It, would, it needs to be understood. His point is, does a manufacturing unit create its own MIS or use existing financial software and generate data? I've sent you this question. Show me your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I presume that when he means existing financial software is something like, you know, Nally or QuickBooks. Um, and both of them are equally competent. They can tally. QuickBooks comes like you know completely fully prepared, but tally is is more like you know it's it's more like uh, uh, you need a good you need to have a good pundit before you understand tally as a god. Uh, so you need to have a good guy who can implement it. So there are there are a lot of tally partners who are very competent. If you if you find a good tally partner, I don't think you need any other. Uh, you know, for, for, as an SME, and even if it, even if you go to you know 200, 300 crores of turnover, you wouldn't need any other financial reporting software. So financial data has to come out of Tally, and that can be you know enabled if you have a good Tally partner. And then, but as since it is a manufacturing unit, I presume, and I would strongly recommend that he has to work on more on lead indicators than on financial lag indicators. So his lead indicators will all be quantitative and non-financial. Therefore, depending upon what is this kind of business, he has to have his own way of capturing those uh, lead indicators. And then that should be a significant issue that he should focus on in, in terms of uh, uh, having his own MIS. And he should try and marry the non-financial and then see what is the impact of that on financial. So uh, to give a short answer to this, a manufacturing unit has to create its own MIS for the non-financial and can use the existing financial software, be it Tally or QuickBooks. And then it also has to marry these two and then it has to have an integrated MIS. So that's the answer. Right. And I think another dimension to this question uh, and perhaps the answer is that, you know, there is already uh, a mass learnings and accumulated learnings that are invested into these uh, 
systems and softwares uh, versus to my mind what Ashit is trying to ask is you know given the nature of his uh, enterprise etc does he need to customize or you know rely on what is typically uh, can the can the frameworks or the reporting formats from these systems be reliable or is it that he should be focusing on customizing you know to get it indicated I think that's the most subjective uh, deep dive uh, question when one engages so I agree uh, I think the last question friends is uh, from Anand Baldwa Anand does uh, admit that he missed this point when he when it was brought up but again uh, I've just uh, sent it to you Srini and uh, the question is uh, Anand is finding it difficult to see how CFO bridge uh, can be a permanent full-time solution and his question is uh, does CFO bridge help in recruiting a right permanent CFO at the right time which is the question that I, I had asked uh, Srini as well so Srini Either if you want to repeat or you want to add to that. I'll, I'll repeat it. I think I'll, re I'll repeat it. Sure. For um, so I, I mentioned that our model is a BOTT model, which is build, operate, train, and transition model. So we have actually helped a couple of companies to recruit the right type of CFO for them. And not only the right type of CFO, in one company, we actually happened to recruit a CFO who is found to be a bit short on experience. But we we thought that you know he he's, he's, he's not only a, he, uh, we thought that he is more a hypo than uh, uh, equally as a hyper. Hyper is high performance. Hypo is high potential. But he was a bit short of short on experience. So we actually held his hand for close to about six months time. So and and then now he's on his own and you know we, we don't even engage with the company now and you know once in a while we just check if he's doing fine so uh, we, we 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 could be while we could be we have no problem with that while we could be the full time solution for a company but we don't want to be we want to work on a BOTT model we want to train recruit and uh, every work that we do Systematically, we train the team so that they could do it. We can agree the engagements, and you know, in such a way that there are milestones defined to ensure that the right team is in the right hand and they are trained in the right way. And then the CFO bridge team disengages. Lovely. So thanks, Srini, for patiently uh, taking all these questions and deep diving and sharing this time and thought. 